you. No, no. It's been a great afternoon so far, right? Good. Uh, as, just as the other speakers, it's my pleasure to uh, be here with everybody this afternoon. Uh, you know, it, it's any time you're in front of your peers, it's, it's always a humbling experience, so thank you for attending. I'm here uh, today to uh, talk a little bit about treating the uh, maxillary gingival excess. I think that's how the, uh, this particular session was uh, uh, kind of put forth, and uh, the uh, organizing committee asked that I talk about aesthetic crown lengthening. You know, one of the challenges that we have uh, when you have a meeting like this is that there, it's very difficult not to have a, a significant amount of overlap. But I think it, it's, it's going to work out okay. None of us really had seen any of our programs and, and there will be a little overlap, but not much. As, as understanding the audience that we have here, knowing that most everybody are, is a periodontist, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on surgery. It's, re, it's a relatively easy procedure for all of us. Instead, I'd prefer to spend more time on examination, on guidelines, on communication. I think that's really what's going to allow us to end up having a long-lasting uh, uh, aesthetic result. And when it comes to anterior aesthetic crown lengthening, it, it, it's a lot of art, you know. It's like many areas of dentistry that that, uh, the, the, that depends on art, depends on design, and so I'm going to give you guidelines that I think will help us achieve uh, the most beautiful outcome. But art's not enough. We also have to understand and respect the bio biology behind that. Otherwise, we'll get into trouble. So where possible, we'll talk also about the biology behind the surgery we're performing so that we can not only get a beautiful result, but also a sustainable and predictable result. As has been kind of pounded into you here today, the, the tooth position determines the final endpoint of position. You never want to pick up a knife until you know where the incisal edge is. And the tooth position, the position of the incisal edges, gingival margin papilla, is determined by the tooth position. As we, first thing we want to look at is the relationship between the position of the teeth to the face. And we've got guidelines that we want to look at. We are, ideally, our occlusal plane should parallel the interpupillary line. We should be able to bisect the face and have a nice symmetrical situation. Here's a lady that presented to me. She didn't like uh, her asymmetric gingival smile. And so let's look at the position of her teeth in relationship to the face and see whether we're ready to pick up the knife. Well, here's the interpupillary line. We bisect the face and, yep, comes right between the central incisors. That's a nice start. But how about the occlusal plane? Are we ready at this point to begin anterior crown lengthening to even all of this out? We can't do that yet because we don't have the incisal edges where we want them to be in relationship to the face, and we certainly can't then use that to come in and guide where we're ultimately going to end up aesthetically following reestablishing the incisal edge length and anterior crown lengthening. So the first thing we want to do is look at the position of the teeth in relationship to the face. Once we do that, then we want to look at the position of the teeth in relationship to the lips. You know, I heard somebody say one time that it's the lip line that defines the aesthetic zone. You know, only about 16% of our patients have a broad enough smile that shows anything that we're even talking about here. And I would suggest that it's not the lip line, it's the patient that determines the aesthetic zone. I do lots of things on my patients that are not seen in full smile because they know they're there, it bothers them. As we look at the position of the tip in relationship, the teeth in relationship to the lips, we also want to look at the vertical and horizontal limits of the smile. The vertical limits we want to look at both in full smile and repose for the reasons that we've already talked about in the other two lectures, and the horizontal limits of the smile, it also determines how far do we want to go back posteriorly with our anterior aesthetic crown lengthening. A common surgical mis mistake is only to crown lengthen the anterior six teeth. Almost all the time, you've got to go back to the mesial line angle of the first molar. So by looking at the horizontal limits of the smile, that helps us determine that as well. There are a number of crown lengthening guidelines that will allow us to determine where we want to place the gingival margins. And the very first thing is to establish the incisal edge position. Have you heard that yet? 
you always establish the incised alleged position first. Once you know where that is, then knowledge of average tooth length can be helpful. And there are studies that will give us an idea of what average tooth lengths are. You know, my Wheeler's textbook of dental anatomy, as Stephen or one of us, one of the other speakers were talking about, there was no, that's how I learned lengths of teeth, but there was no studies that, you know, that came from. It was just, you know, that was what we were taught. But here's a study that <clears throat> comes out of the orthodontic literature, Starrett, Albert, and Robinson. They mainly just look at healthy individuals. And they looked at the length and width of centrals, laterals, and canines. And they found that, yeah, there was some differences, but basically the length to width ratio maintained stable. That about a 10 to 8 length to width ratio. So that's another little nice thing to have in our bag as we're to trying to determine what the proper tooth length should be if we're going to alter uh, the gingival margin. And at what point is it safe to do so? You know, I'm all the time sent kids right after they have the bands taken off of their orthodontics and they don't like their gummy smile, mom's pushing for that. Well, do we, is it safe to do it when that kid is 12 like you see or do I have to wait till he's 28? Again, we can look to the evidence base to help us determine that. Another orthodontic literature, uh, Delancey, Clayton, and Jones did a systematic review, and what they found was is there's a lot of change in tooth length up to about 12 years. And then it really flattens out from about 12 to 16, and then from about 16 to 18, there's virtually no change. And once you get beyond 18, certainly no change. So this type of information allows at least me to sleep a little better at night, knowing at what point is it safe for me to go ahead and do that crown lengthening that the patient or the mother is desiring. And this is, you know, a case in point. The patient, uh, she's wanting to have her uh, senior pictures done. And, and, you know, she's uh, 18 years old. Yeah, very simple procedure, but something that really is, makes a meaningful difference for her. Relationship of the gingival margin to the lip. Again, already been talked about today, and I'm really not even going to, uh, you guys did such a great job, won't even talk about that anymore. Crown lengthening also, you need to look at the position of the CEJ. I was far more cavalier in the past about where I'm going to crown length if I have a restorative commitment. Because I thought, okay, if I have a restorative commitment, then, you know, the restorations are going to take care of anything I might do. So if you're going to be crown lengthy beyond the CEJ, the first thing you've obviously got to worry about is reduced attachment. Because the more your bone you're taking off, you know, you're taking supporting structure away from the tooth. I don't think I had probably ever did enough to, you know, cause a problem there. But you also have to think that as you crown lengthen, do crown lengthening beyond the CEJ, you are getting up onto the root form, onto the root. And what's happening with those roots? As you go up, what's happening to the roots? You're getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And, and, and if you're ending up with the restorative margin high up on the root, it's going to be more constricted. There's nothing that the best restorative doctor can do to change that. And, and so I now would, you know, it's, a gummy smile is oftentimes not the aesthetic problem. It's tooth shape that's the aesthetic problem. I would rather, rather end up with a little bit more gummy smile and an ideal tooth shape. And so I'm going to err more on that rather than end up with these kind of bell-shaped crowns. And then, of course, the worst problem is, is what's happening with those roots is they're getting smaller, smaller, smaller. Your interproximal space is getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And you may be able, you may end up with an even worse problem, and that is with an open interproximal space that you can't close, even with uh, a restorative commitment. So we do, uh, just as, uh, as Dr. Chu was talking, we do, there are many times that, that you're going to be changing the position of the interproximal, your papillas, but you have to know what you're doing. And when you don't have to, you know, avoid it. And there are many times you don't have to do that. You know, if you have abrasion eruption, then there's, you've got to do that because you've got to reposition your papilla. And if you're going to do that, you have to understand what's going on here. There's a lot of papers that talk about but flap design in, in, in preserving the papillas. You know, 
here's a case of mine where I went in, did straight line lingual incisions, flipped out the papillas, and, and you know, got full interproximal, uh, ended up with full interproximal papillas. Now, did that flap design, did that, is that why the, the final looks good? No. I mean, you, yes, you have to make sure you're respecting the tissue, that you're doing nice, you know, soft tissue surgery, but it's the interproximal bone that determines where those papillas are going to be and the relationship to the teeth, not that flap design. You know, here's a paper that I don't think I could get through my IRB right now that Vanderbilt did in 82. He went in and cut away all the papillas and then waited to see what happened. Three years later, after he cut away all the papillas, he measured and had 4.5 millimeters from the alveolar crest to the tip of papilla. Had a sulcus depth of about two. Does that, that measurement sound familiar? Yeah. It's the same one that uh, we've been talking about here, uh, the often cited Tarnow paper, looking at the fact that if you have less than five millimeters from the contact area to the alveolar crest, you're going to have, you know, you're just not going to have open and approximal spaces. And as just as, as Stephen was saying, it's kind of doing the math. It's not that difficult. Here's a patient that we're going to do significant crown lengthening on. We do have a restorative commitment. We're going to re, we're doing, I'm doing flap offset surgery, crown lengthening, 360 degrees around the tooth. We're repositioning the papilla as well as the facial margins. We're going to go in and reestablish a new and size a ledge. Here we are at three months. Now, the patient's saying, you know, that looks pretty good, but what about these open spaces here? Well, what are we telling? I tell him, don't worry about it. Now, am I saying that because I just hope he's going to forget and move to Mexico? No, because we've measured. We know where the incisal, I mean, we know where the contact point is. We know where the bone is. And we know that with time, it's all going to fill in. It's all a matter of just knowing the recipe and making sure you're following it, making sure your laboratory knows it, and, you know, it, it works out. It's biology. Communication is really tough in a lot of these. You have to communicate effectively with your patients and your restorative colleagues because, you know, I may be talking about crown lengthening. My patient is thinking you're going to crown, you're going to lengthen the inside of the ledge. I'm thinking I'm going to raise the gingival margin. Both are crown lengthening, but both are very different, or we may be doing a combination of both of those. So communication is one of the most difficult things. Some of our patients, they know exactly what they want. The thing that bothers me the most is this, this gum. It's, it's, this is really low. My front left tooth, I believe, was the one that my gum line came real low. And then the right tooth, the gum line was real high. That's what caught my eye. Dr. Michael McGuire moves the gum around each tooth to give his clients a structurally sound smile. The gum is, is kind of like the, the frame around a picture. And you can have the most gorgeous picture, but if the frame is off, then it distorts everything. You can tell I've been doing this for a while. I looked a little younger there, didn't I? <laughs> You know, there's a lot of ways to communicate. One is, is imaging. There's good and there's bad. You know, you can do this pretty quick, but there's bad part is it only shows before and after and doesn't show the relationship to what you're going to do to the dynamic movements of the lips. And, and you don't, you want to make sure, as many as you don't overpromise. I mean, here is an actual image that was sent to me. You know, please do this. And here is the, the final uh, result. And we were able to achieve pretty much what the, they asked for imaging. But if you go from, you know, digital, you can also go to analog, and that is just pick up an, an alcohol marker and, and mark on the gingiva. Give your patient a, a, a mirror to look into. You know, you, you can do very simple things to help with communication. We use provisional restorations, both as surgical guides and communication tools. We treat a lot of bulimic patients. You know, if you are, want to increase your practice, they're in every major city bulimic uh, uh, groups, just like Alcoholic Anonymous. Almost all of these people need full mouth reconstruction. You know, align yourself with these people. But now, where are you going to do crown? How do you know where you're going to crown lengthen this patient? You don't. Why? You don't know where the incisal of the ledge is, right? So first thing you've got to do is pre create provisionals. These teeth have not been prepared. Provisionals have been made. They just pop on. They've got, say, a flange that goes up on where the gingival margin should be. You've established your incisal ledge. I've taken a surgical marker, marked on there, and X marks the spot. That's where I know my gingival margin is going to have to be. 
Also, these surgical guides like this speak to the patient emotionally. Lots of decisions, most decisions are made on emotions, not facts. This allows the patient, their significant others to look at this, try to get this away from the patient once you give it to them. You know, they can go home, show it to everybody. You see the dynamics of the lips movements with this in place. Many of our patients, though, don't require provisional restoration. So how are we going to handle those? Well, we use a lot of surgical guides or trial smiles to help. Now, this patient, Manish talked about a patient that was, you know, you want to watch out for. This is one like that, too. This lady comes into me six weeks before she's going to get married. She's about 40 years old, never been married, and, you know, wants to look her best and, and wants to have crown lengthening before her wedding and restoration. So first job off, we have to say that's not possible. You're going to have to do it later. To make matters worse, she brings in a satchel full of pictures of movie stars, and I want to look exactly like this. My radars are going up, so maybe I don't want to treat this lady. And, and so after we convince her that you know, she, her wedding pictures are going to have to be like this, but you know, if she wants to, come back later. Now, this lady's chief complaint was, I don't like my short teeth. Now this is not, I'm not the first person to see her. She saw somebody before and this is the incisal edge. Somebody heard, I don't like my short teeth. He gave her long teeth. Got it? So we're not communicating here. So what we do is we create a little surgical guide or a trial smile, either out of a bisphil or a triad or whatever you want to do, where you create your new gingival margin, your proposed gingival margin, your incisal edge. Then you can put it in the mouth. In this case, we're going to block out, black out the incisal edge with your trusty OSHA-approved wax pencil. And then you know, have the patient smile and say, is this what you had in mind? In this case, let her new husband look at it. See, yeah, that's what I wanted all along. And then I can take this to surgery. Now I've just taken an indelible pencil, go around the edges here, take it off. Here we see at the top the, where the indelible pencil is. The X marks the spot for my gingivectomy. Now we've done that. We place our guide back on to make sure our gingivectomy is where we want it to be. But if we probe, we see, uh, yep, we have removed the tissue all the way to the osseous crest. We can't leave that, of course, because we've got to reestablish the biologic width. We can do that, place our stent back on, confirm now that we've got at least three millimeters from the proposed gingival margin to the osseous crest. 